Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel 9. We're going to take chunks here. We've been taking chunks of, of text in the book of Samuel. We're not going to read all of this. I would encourage you to read the story. I'm going to read some of it. I'm going to summarize more of it. But it's for sake of time a little bit. We're not going to read it all today. But last week, uh, Marshall, Danny, and I had the opportunity to sit down with a friend of ours. It was a friend of mine from college uh, who called up and said, hey, can we get together? And, and this particular man, uh, God has done some remarkable things through his life. He currently is, uh, he was able on his own, through his own efforts as a missionary, uh, to secure 250 acres in Uganda. And he secured these 250 acres, and he has built up, uh, as a result of that, a, a compound, it's not a compound, a, a, a swath of land that is centered around a church that they, they are making disciples and proclaiming Christ in this church, but they also have a, a thriving school and medical option for people of the community to come. And not only that, they're going to now have it where scores of men who want to be pastors, who are our pastors, who aren't theologically trained, can come and they can get trained for the ministry. I mean, it, it, as I look at it, at, at the scope and breadth of what they're doing in Uganda, it is fantastic. And I look back at uh, my friend, his name is Shannon, as I look back in college, I said, I told him, and I, and I meant this affectionately, like I, ne I didn't see this coming from him. He was just a normal guy. He, was, he played soccer a little bit. We served on leadership together, and, and he did what a lot of guys did in our era. He graduated from college, and he went to seminary, got married, had kids. And I'm like, yeah, he's going to be a, a faithful guy, not this remarkable ministry. And he did what a lot of seminarians had to do. They had to get a, a job while he's going to pay the bills, and he got a job at a, a teddy bear company, as you do. And it was uh, Beverly Hills Teddy Bear where you actually cold call businesses and try to sell them teddy bears. America's great. Sell them teddy bears that they use for promotional things. I don't know. I'm not a salesman. And I know of countless young men who tried their hand at this. Cold calling people, hey, would you like to buy some teddy bears? And, and, and they failed miserably. Uh, all my friends, and I've told them, you failed miserably. I love it. Uh, but, but Shannon, Shannon remarkably turned that into a, a small fortune. Uh, he remarkably got the account, I don't know if you've heard of it, Aflac, with that duck, okay, that's emblazoned in your mind. And if, I, if you say that, you're like, oh, I, I despise it, but you know it. And, and all of a sudden he gets his account and he sold countless numbers of these stuffed ducks. So much so that he leveraged after eight years that he could help fund. He stopped that, gave this account to, to another guy, and, and has used that money to fund so much of this going on in Africa. So much so that, that I, I reminded him of this, and he reminded me of that, that uh, there was a phrase that something happened with Shannon, that, that he got a golden horseshoe s stuck somewhere in his body. Like, I mean, like no one could figure out how he did it. Other people tried to replicate it, they couldn't do it. Something was different about him. And what they're trying to figure out is, how did this guy get so lucky? And my question is, was it luck? Was it luck for Shannon to go from, to do seminary full-time, get done with seminary, as he's doing that, he's building this account to sell fuzzy ducks to make money to be able to do missions in Uganda. The thought gets us today is it's interesting that when mankind tries to categorize or explain the world around us without the acknowledgement of a sovereign God, you have to come up with all kinds of different concepts, different words to try to explain that. Somebody, uh, so-and-so is either lucky or unlucky. We don't know what that means. It just means we can't figure out why things happen. In fact, there's a psychology professor named Richard Wiseman who wrote a book called The Luck Factor. Anybody read The Luck Factor? 
Good. That was a test, because we were going to talk afterward. Here, here's what he said, and he described the traits of a lucky person, somebody who makes their own luck. And that person, number one, maximizes opportunities. Number two, they listen to their own intu intuition. Number three, they are optimists. And number four, they are resilient. And the phrase where opportunity meets preparation. In other words, he's trying to figure out how are some people so lucky? How did Shannon do it and these other guys not be able to have it happen? And it's, we got to explain it some way. Others will try to explain this world and will leave things to chance, to fortune, or to fate. I believe all of those, in, in the end, are pretty nihilistic. They're nihilistic in nature, saying whatever is must be, and leaving futures up to a nebulous, unloving, and at best a neutral force. Maybe, hopefully what we're up against in this life is a neutral force where we make our own way, we make our own luck, that's the best case scenario. Or the worst case scenario, we have some force, call it mother nature, call it some smaller deity that are whimsical in nature and we never know if we're gonna tick off mother nature and here comes a hurricane. Even when people will acknowledge that there is a God, okay, you got me, maybe there is a deity out there, often that God is like a clockmaker who winds up the world, okay, I, I guess there is a God, he winds up the world and then takes his hands off and then, and then lets it run and just lets natural law take its, take its course and, and the world is just running on its own and, and what happens, it happens and, and ah, I hope it turns out good for me. This, I believe, is the predominant reason. I, I actually think that's the predominant philosophy and thought, but it's also the predominant reason why our world is so full of, ready, fear. I wrote this before I went to uh, Trader Joe's yesterday. So this wasn't a result of going to Trader Joe's, but at Trader Joe's yesterday, I'm like, what's on sale? Like, did I miss some going out of business sale? Because why am I getting elbowed in the produce aisle? as people are stocking up on produce, I don't know, on, on kombucha that they sell, whatever, that they're, they're I gotta have my kombucha. Uh, stocking up on this stuff because there's a hurricane coming. Now, I don't mean to make light of hurricanes. Hurricanes have done extensive damage, sure, all through the world, but, but when I heard that we're gonna have some rain, like up to three inches and some wind, up to 30 miles an hour. I'm like, have you been here in October? <laughs> have you been here at Christmas Eve a few years ago? <laughs> right, yeah, if you were there, you know what I'm talking about. And, 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 and I'm going, wow, what is going on? And, and fear, fear has become the catchword of our culture. Be afraid. Be afraid of what's coming. Be afraid of what you don't know. Be afraid of what could happen. Be afraid of circumstances. Be afraid. And, and if you go out or you don't go out or you, you get next to people or you're not next to people, you should be afraid. Wow. I mean, what a systematic way to move people around to make them afraid. Listen, as believers, we don't have to be afraid because we know exactly what's going on. Does that, mean, does that mean that hurricanes won't do damage to our home, that hurricanes will miss believer homes? No, but we understand why things are going on, and so we actually can live a settled, restful, calm, satisfied, content life. God does not work in the way of fear. God, God works in not fateful ways, not lucky ways, not in ways of chance. We believe that God is sovereign over all things, amen? Like the foundational reality that we have in our minds and hearts and knowledge is that God is sovereign. If you believe that today, I mean, you have knowledge that most of the world only can dream of. Your God, my God, the God of this universe is in control and is powerful over the entire universe. That's the God, thank you. I was gonna keep going until I heard it. But I know our church, it was gonna be a while, all right, so that's okay. God is, not only does what's right, he is powerful to do all that he wills. 
Psalm 115 verse 3 says this, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Everything he, that brings him pleasure, everything according to his will, he will do. So different than us. I have will. I, I have thoughts. I have plans. I have desires and decisions that I make. And you know how many things I ultimately control how they turn out? Huh? Nothing. Ultimately. But God's sovereignty is also purposeful. That's what we're going to talk about today. We, we major on God's sovereignty, but, but a subset of God's sovereignty is the purposefulness of his providence. This morning, we're going to talk about God's providence, where God, and the word providence simply means that God sees, for all of my CC people, in Latin, vide, means to see. I know you knew that, and you probably have a song about it. Anyway, you, you, you know that, and I probably even said vide wrong. It's fine. Confront me afterward. But providence is a word that means to see and to provide. God sees and knows all things. This is what the Bible says about God seeing. And I'm telling you, the fact that God sees all things is good news. Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in his temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven, is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on evil and on good. What about Deuteronomy eleven twelve? a land, this is talking about Israel and the land, a land that the Lord your God cares for, the eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it. Job 34, 21, for the eyes are on the ways of a man and he sees all of his steps. What about Hebrews 4, 13? And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God sees all things, not passively, but actively. So he sees all things and nothing, nothing is hidden from him. And, and it's not that uh, you can even hide from God because, because he sees all things material, but he sees the immaterial. He sees what's in your heart. He sees what's in your mind. He sees your motives and intentions. In other words, there is nothing even inside of you. There is nothing that's ever happened to you, nothing you've ever done that he doesn't know about. But not only that, he not only sees, that would be one thing. I mean, if he sees all things, and, but he's just a passive God who goes, ha, 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 look what happened to you. He's a God who provides. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says he gives strong support. The eyes of the Lord are, are throughout the world. He gives strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. He provides for the righteous. Psalm 32, verse 8, he will counsel us with his eye upon us. Matthew 6, 26 to 30. Matthew 6, 26 to 30, God sees all things. He knows all things, including his provision and care for us, that he knows and provides for the flowers of the field, the grass of the field, and the birds of the air. If he provides so much for them, he's going to provide so much more for us. In Matthew 10, 29 to 31, he cares if the sparrow dies. Can you believe that? There's two sparrows, one dies, and he knows about it. I had a dove in my, on my fence line, and I, I, I did a little experiment. Should I, and I had to remove my fence, so I was going to have to remove those doves. And people are like, don't you touch that dove. So I didn't. God took care of them. But he knows. Not only know, does he know that, he knows the number of hairs on your head. The God of this universe, who does big, spectacular things, knows exactly the number of hairs on your head. Now, some of you have made it easier for him over the years. <laughs> but he knows. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> but you know who you are. 1 Peter 3.12, his eyes are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but his face is against those who do evil. 
God sees and he provides, and this is good news for us. There is nothing that happens in your life circumstantially, nothing that has happened to you, and even bad decision you've made that counteracts God's sovereignty and his, and his providential care in your life. So let me give you three quick overlapping definitions of providence that will help us in this chapter. There's a reason why I'm doing this because this chapter is a fascinating study in providence because there's a lot of detail there and you read the chapter, you're like, why did God give us all this detail? And I'm gonna try to, to point you to that, but, but let me give you three definitions of providence. If you wanna review these, they're in the notes that we hand out. You have a paper copy, they're also downloadable on our website. And so if you want these definitions written down, uh, that'd be helpful. But the first is this by John Piper, who wrote a book appropriately named Providence. And here's what John Piper said as a definition. The providence of God is his purposeful sovereignty. His sovereignty in action in the, hand, in, in the lives of people by which he will be completely successful in the achievement of his ultimate goal for the universe. God's providence carries his plans into action, guides all things toward his ultimate goal and leads to the final consummation. I like that. In other words, everything that is going on, every little detail, great and small, is moving toward a final consummation of the glory of his grace and his will. I mean, that is, that is fantastic news. Second, here's what Dale Davis said about providence. That wonderful, what is it? That wonderful, strange, mysterious, unguessable way Yahweh has of ruling his world and sustaining his people. And his doing it frequently, over, under, around, through, or in spite of the most common stuff of our lives, or even the bias of our wills. In other words, he said that in light of Israel, that even Israel's bad choices, and I would say by extension, even our sinful choices, cannot counteract God's providence in playing out his will. We'll unpack that idea in a second, but that's a really important information. And to say that providence is a historic thing is true. The Westminster Confession of Faith, written in 1646, says, what is providence? It is God, the great creator of all things. God, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least. Be his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible knowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will. And here's the, the key phrase, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Not random, not by chance, not by luck. Everything is being done to the praise of his glorious grace and will. So providence is how God's unseen hand, right? Uh, we, we believe there's a God even though we can't see him. We, we believe he's at work even though we can't see uh, with our eyes. We believe in his unseen hand that is active in our lives each day. And this is why we can trust God in our decision-making, in the unknown, and to rest in a tumultuous world that cannot find peace. We trust God is working all things out to the praise of his glory, which is the source of our ultimate good and joy. The fact that God is in control and has the ability to work all things out means we can trust him when we face the unknown, live in a world that is crumbling under progressive sin and joyfully rest assured that God redeems even our bad and sinful decisions for his glory. I love the fact that because that is true, we face the world differently as believers. There's a phrase that, that can sometimes become token with Christians. Sometimes we say token things and maybe it loses its emphasis. But there's a phrase I really like and I think we should all use it. We'll say, well, this is happening in our life and we've made this decision, but, but it's, the caveat of that decision is if the Lord what? If he wills, if he wills. Meaning we hold our decisions with an open hand trusting that if his will isn't, isn't happening, if his will isn't being accomplished, by means, please change our decision. Please change our direction. 
I talked to good friends this week. They knew who they are. And they moved away from see me and, and, and wanted to come back to see me. We're like the mob. You try to get away. We kind of bring you back. You, you can't really get away. And they thought, for sure, this is what God's doing. He's bringing us back to see me. All, it's all lining up. And then they try to get back in to see me, and it didn't work. And now they're living in Ventura. And they're like, we didn't, we didn't think we'd ever live in Ventura. We didn't want to live in Ventura, but here we are. And they go, and yet, this is exactly where God wants us. Isn't that great? And it's funny, I, I heard that story. I'm like, man, you could change the perspective of that story and go, when can we catch a break? Doggone it. When's it going to go well for us? Ah, we're in Ventura. You could easily see th that story and, and, and get frustrated and angry and resentful. Or it could be a story of God's grace where you say, man, God is so good and gracious to us. It changes everything. It helps us wait on the Lord. It helps us wait when our plans get messed up, when we thought that life finally got settled. Man, we're finally in a place that everything's lining up and all of a sudden something changes. Ugh, what's going on? If God wasn't sovereign and his providential hand wasn't there, honestly, I get why people are so afraid. If everything's happened by random chance, man, run for the hills, run for your lives. Stock up on kombucha, man. Like, I don't, I, that, that's what I would do. I get it. But that's not who we are. Now, why do I say all of that? Because we come to a text that's a lot of, uh, to say in 1 Samuel 9, we see this whole section framed as an expression of God's providential care over his people Israel. And what you have in a story of, of, of 1 Samuel 9, here, here's what happens, right? We left in chapter 8 last week, and, and you remember this quick story is that, that God says, I'm your king. Israel says, no, we want a real king. Give us a, a man king. We want a, somebody who looks good in armor. Don't do it. You don't want a king. I'm your king. I will fight your battles. No, we want a real king, real king, real king. And he goes, fine, I'll give you what you want. And chapter 9 is now how God is working that out, how it comes to be. Now listen, 1 Samuel 9 is a little bit like the book of Job. Remember the book of Job, Job 1 and 2, where, where the only ones who know what's really going on is us? And, and you're looking at Job, and you're like, come on, Job, God's talking with Satan, and it's all, he's working it out, he's, he's, he's in it. And, and Job goes, I don't, I don't get to see that. I have to trust that by faith. 1 Samuel 9 lays out like everybody in the story is a little bit in the dark. Everybody in the story is trying to figure out what's going on. We get insight into it, but, but really what we get insight into is our own lives as God is working out every detail in minutia to work out his praise and glory, but, but we don't get to see behind the curtain very often. And 1 Samuel 9 is seeing behind the curtain of what God is doing. I believe to strengthen our faith. And here's what we see. This section tells the story of how Saul was anointed king and how Israel's rejection could not thwart or paralyze God's plan or his providential care. If my sin, listen, if my sin or your sin could thwart God's providential care, it would. If my sin could somehow change God's sovereign plan, it absolutely would. But it doesn't. He still works out his will even in our sin. That gives us an amazing amount of comfort today as God redeems all things for his glory and our good. So let's look at the text together. That's a long introduction. That's what we call, you know, the 20-minute introduction. And that's okay. So let's look here. At this first section, I just want to get our minds around the story. The larger story is God's providence is often unseen or unnoticed in the minutia of life. First Samuel 9, let me, just, let me just try to tell you the story, and then we'll pick apart the parts. But the story is this. We meet this guy named Saul. And, and Saul comes out of nowhere, like he, we haven't seen him before, we haven't seen his family before. He's this young man living in... The, the, the area of Benjamin, and he comes on the scene. And here's how the story unfolds, is he's looking for donkeys. He's, his father has lost a herd of donkeys, 
And so he's looking for these donkeys. Those donkeys are probably in a radius of plus or minus six or seven miles from here. So you're thinking like from here to parts of Moore Park, into the valley, up into the hills. I mean, it's a pretty large swath. And he goes and looks for these donkeys. He can't find them. His servant said, hey, there's a prophet in our land. We should go see him. He didn't really want to, but he's convinced to. He goes and sees that prophet. That prophet happens to be whom? Samuel. And Samuel welcomes him in. He has a feast for him. Saul spends the night, and the next day, Saul will be anointed by Samuel. That's the story. And you go, that preaches. It doesn't. Okay, that's a tough preaching section, right? But that's the story. And so here in the minutiae, we get to see how God's plan is unfolding. Now, it would only be this funny narrative unless you had verses 15 to 17. We're going to get to verses 15 to 17, and that's where the veil is is kind of rolled back, and we get to see what God is actually doing here. But that's, that's the story, okay? He's looking for lost donkeys. Part of me really wanted to read this in the King James Version. For those of you who grew up in the King James Version, you know why. But I'm not going to. Here's what we remember. Listen, God is at work in the big decisions and the big things. He's also at work in the minutia. Every day, every day has purpose and meaning because God is working every little thing, every big thing out to accomplish what he wants to do in your life. Everything. Think about it. Think about how you got here today. I was reviewing my life. How did, how did I get to the point where I'm here in Simi Valley? How did I get to a point where I could marry a wonderful wife and have these wonderful kids, and and your life is this consummation of these choices that are anything but random. And you just sit back and go, God, thank you for bringing me to the place you've brought me today, because I know you're in control, and I know you're doing it for a reason. So let's do this. Read the first two verses. We're going to make some observations about Saul, and then we're going to move forward uh, to verses 15 to 17. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Neror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. For his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Here we have a description of God giving the people what they wanted. Notice this description of Saul. It starts with the fact that he was from a wealthy family. That's nice. Benjamin was a good tribe. Even the name Saul means asked for or dedicated. And this reads like the early love notes from my wife to me. Because twice he's, he's referred to as handsome. I said, love, once is enough. I get it. Stop. Stop. But twice it's emphasized that he was handsome. He not only was handsome, he was a head and shoulders above everybody else. In other words, if you lined up all the eligible young man, young men in Israel, you'd go, ah, oh, there he is. And so, so this is a depiction of exactly what the people were asking for. This well put together, good looking, handsome, tall young man. What's interesting is that this is the only time that an Israelite was identified by his height, since physical stature and prowess was a mark of Israel's enemies. So again, God shining a light on the one they wanted, not the one that they needed. Now, I sometimes believe, uh, just get a time out. We're going to take a look at some of Saul's positives here, but a lot of Saul's negatives. But I I think sometimes Saul gets a bad rap. Uh, Saul, it's very clear in the text as we move on from chapter 9, Saul didn't ask for this. He didn't want it. He was kind of like that number one draft pick overall in a sport that doesn't pan out. And everyone's like, oh, he's a bust. He's terrible. But if he was drafted in like the fourth round, it would have been fine. So you go, ah, the guy didn't ask to be drafted number one overall. Like, that happened to him. You brought him in, and it didn't go according to plan. That's kind of Saul. So there were some things about Saul uh, that are good. There are some things about Saul that were real. But you notice in that description in the first two verses, what wasn't mentioned about Saul at all? His character. His character. 
This is, as a father of daughters, right? This is like, like if you give me a description, if you come and say, I want my young son to date and marry your daughter and you bring your dowry and you pay the price and you pay the, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a cost that we'll, we'll talk about. And you say, but look at my son. He's tall and handsome. I go, great, neat, that's fine. Tell me about his life. Character matters. When we hire people at the church or the school, it's saying, I, I could you could teach people to do a lot of things, but I can't teach the character part. You either have that in a growing way or not. Character matters. And it's very clear that the man God chose for Israel was a man they wanted, not what they asked for. He's going to give them a man of character in David, but that's to come. So let's start with some positives about Saul. Here are some positives. In chapter 9, verse 5, uh, he goes out and looks for his father's donkeys, and he's out for a while, and he goes, ah, I actually have some concern. It's been a little long. I don't have a cell phone. I have no way to talk to my dad. My dad's going to be worried. And so he had concern for his father. Second, you see that as the text goes on, he's going to respond to say, I guess, I guess I should go see the prophet of the Lord. Maybe I should inquire of the Lord. That was good. And, and then when, when his servant said, uh, first Saul said, I don't have anything to bring. I don't have the cultural thing to bring to the prophet. And his, uh, his servant said, here, there's a, a quarter shekel you can bring. He goes, fine. In other words, Saul knew social protocol. He was a nice guy. He was a guy that when he came to date your daughter, he'd bring flowers. He remembered his mom's birthday and called on Mother's Day. When he came over to your house, he, was, he took his shoes off and he didn't overstay his welcome. He, he had social protocol. He was a nice guy. <coughs> By the way, nice guys put into leadership wreck and destroy. He, he was a nice guy, but he wasn't a man of character. And here's what we see. Here were some of the shortcomings that were revealed that he was not the man Israel needed as king. It's interesting. Uh, most of the kings, most of the leaders, what was the one occupation that you would say overarching uh, was the occupation for most of Israel's quality leadership in the Old Testament? What was their occupation? They were what? Shepherds. Shepherds. And, and it's an it's a apt analogy for spiritual leadership. In Ezekiel chapter 34, the description of spiritual leaders in Israel were like shepherds. They were supposed to feed the sheep, protect the sheep, seek after and rescue, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak. And here you have, as a depiction, the first, the first action that you see of Saul is he couldn't find donkeys. In a six-mile radius, he, he, he couldn't find the, the missing and wandering donkeys. And they're, and they're like, neighing, and they can't find them. Second, it's fascinating. Though he went to see the prophet or the seer, the fact that he did not know Samuel. Listen, it says that Samuel was living in the, in the land of Zuf. Zuf is within Benjamin. In other words, in other words, in chapter uh, 3, verse 20, it said that Samuel went through all the land. He did a circuit every year. He was known from the furthest northern border in Dan to the furthest south in Beersheba. Everyone knew who Samuel was, except whom? Saul didn't even know who he was, and he was living in his town and area. So it betrayed that, that yes, he went to seek this spiritual leader for his lost donkeys, but he surely didn't know the spiritual leader. It's fascinating to me. I'm telling you, there is a direct correlation. I could graph it out. I won't. But when I do counseling with men in particular in marital counseling from other churches, and I say, do you go to church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to such and such a church. Who's the pastor? I don't know. Really? Really? You go to a church and you don't know the pastor? There's something amiss about that, and that's with Saul as well. Here also, it shows that Paul wasn't a convictional leader. He was easily swayed. We're going to see that all, all throughout his reign. His servant was the one who led the charge. His servant's like, Saul, we got to do this. This is the way. No, 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 no. Servant says, no, here it is. And the servant walked him to the doorstep of Samuel. Now, all that brings us to verses 15 to 17. That's where we want to spend some time to, to close this out. Look at verse 15. 
If you went from verse 14 to 18, you could tell the whole story seamlessly. This is, again, a picture into what was actually going on behind the scenes. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you will anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He will save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Was everything going on with Saul's lost uh, donkeys by happenstance and chance and luck? By no means. Every single thing that happened in this story was leading to this culmination where he would be in the town at the exact moment that God had said to Samuel to be ready for. There is, there is nothing that goes on in our life that is left to chance. Nothing in our life that God goes, oh, oops, I didn't see that one coming. And notice here, there's a few uh, observations we want to make of this text. The first is this. Notice that he just calls Saul a prince. He doesn't even call him king. Twice he calls him his prince. Yes, he's going to lead another name. It's a leader. He was going to lead his people, but this wasn't the king that God wanted for him. The second, notice this commitment to protection. I love this. Notice what he says. He will save my people from the Philistines. Who fought Israel's battles? God always fought their battles. You go back uh, a couple chapters in chapter seven. If you, if you follow me alone, I will fight your battles. And he did it. And God says, okay, but you're still, and notice, notice the, the phrasing here, what he says three times. This is still my people. I mean, I think if I'm, if I'm a vindictive God, if I'm a God who, who is insecure, I go, you bunch of cotton-headed ninny muggins. Like, come on, you guys, I'm going to leave you out there to dangle, and we're going to watch the much bigger and badder force come and wipe you out, and you get what you deserve, you got what you asked coming, what you had coming for you, ha, ha, ha. Right? Like, there's parts of my heart that that resonates. Anybody else ever feel that way toward people who've wronged you? And so, but God didn't say that. He goes, look, you're still my people and I'm in spite of, in spite of the fact that you asked for this king, in spite of the fact he is not a man of character, in spite of the fact that he is kind of a dingus, right? In, fact, in, in spite of that, he's still gonna lead you into battle and he's still gonna win those battles because I am gonna protect you. That's a commitment. Third, third, there is a huge display of God's mercy. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Anything in your life that you have that's good is by God's hand of grace. You didn't deserve it. Mercy is God withholding from us what we absolutely deserve. And you see God's mercy here. Notice, far from vindictiveness that characterizes our sin nature, God responded with undeserved and lavished mercy. It says here that he heard their cry. And notice it says he saw, he sees their need. That's providence. He providentially saw their need and provided for it. Here's what Dale Davis said. These foolish, stubborn people do not cease to be objects of God's compassion. Again, let no sin be glossed over. Let no excuse it's, uh, that it's God denying wickedness. But sure, if you are a child of God, you rejoice to see that your God is mulish on mercy, that your sin does not dry up the fountain of his compassions. Your sin does not dry up the fountain of God's compassions that his pity refuses to let go of his people. The fact that God listens, the fact that God still responds, still loves in spite of our effusive sin is one of the most glorious realities in all the universe. We look at life thinking things like this, I didn't deserve that. Did I deserve that? Did I deserve to be treated by my spouse that way? I didn't deserve that. 
Did I deserve to be treated by my boss, by our government, by, the, by my neighbor? I didn't deserve any of that. Why can't I catch a break? Why do these things keep happening to me? Why do these bad things keep happening to me? When we wonder why bad things happen or where God is during struggles or what he is doing in circumstances, we can often paint a picture that what is happening is unfair. Is life fair, folks? Is life fair? Do we deserve fairness? Remember this, and we've said this for years, but but it's a good reminder this morning. If God were fair to you, when you feel like the ledger is uneven, you feel like, man, I, I, I have got a, a bad shake here. It feels very unfair to me what's going on. This person, look at, look at everyone. They're succeeding. I'm not. It's unfair. It's unfair. It's unfair. Listen, the next time you think that, if you ask God to be fair to you according to what you deserve, what is the answer? If God were fair to you, God, bring me what is fair what is the answer? What's the next? What's your next breath going to look like? What's your next moment going to be? You will be dead on your way to eternal destruction. That's if God were fair. That's why we say, actually, we ask God to, to be unfair to us, be merciful and gracious to us, give us what we don't deserve, and save us. We have the wrong view of life sometimes. We have the wrong view of how God works and how his loving mercy and has his, how his sovereignty plays out. He is merciful, even when our present scenario is of our own choosing and a result of our own decisions, his mercy is greater. We sing the song, his, our sin was great, but his mercy was more. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If not, just listen. Here's what 2 Timothy 2 verses 8 to 13 says. Here, I love this, and it connects even back to David, what God's going to do, even in spite of Israel's choice, he's going to bring about David the king, which will bring about Jesus the king. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound in chains as a criminal. But the word is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And the saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he will also reign with, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains what? Faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is faithful to his promises. He is faithful in spite of us, in spite of our stubbornness, in spite of our sinful decisions, in spite of the, the times that we shake our fist at him and say, I want to do it my own way and not your way. It cannot, it cannot disrupt him playing out his sovereign will. He is actively working to bring our salvation to completion through the culmination of his grace. In all things, the good and the bad, the easy and the hard, the known and the uncertain, the wise and foolish decisions, his providential hand is on us. He is consistent with his nature, saving those who believe and punishing those who do not. We can bank our trust on a God who is absolute and perfect in every decision and every action. Well, lastly, we'll close with this. Not only is he merciful here, but notice he says he's gentle but consistent. He says, he it is. This is Saul who will restrain my people. The word restrain here is a negative word. It expresses a hindrance or an imprisonment. God's refining and mercy is not without pain. God loves us so much. Listen, God loves us so much like a good parent. Good parenting is hard. <laughs> Good parenting is hard because sometimes as a parent, don't you let your kids play out their bad decisions? And in their bad decisions, they're going to fall, they're going to fail, they're going to skin their knee, they're going to get hurt. And in that hurt, they're going to learn. Isn't that good parenting? 
Don't we want, as good parents, to wrap our kids in bubble wrap, to never let them leave the house? Don't let them get a license, for sure. Don't let them get their car. Don't let them have a relationship. Don't let them have friendships where they may be hurt. Don't let them get married. Don't let them, right? Like, there's part of us that goes, no, just stay. But a good parent will say, look, I know (laughs) there's going to come a point I can't make my decisions for you. I can't control you. You're going to have to learn this on your own. I have to watch you make hard, bad choices for your good. That's what God does here. He's a good dad. He, this is going to be a hindrance to my people, but not an ultimate hindrance. This is, this is all part of my plan to do the ultimate good for you, even though for the short run, it's going to be hard. It's going to be bad. It's how God's sovereignty plays out in his providence. The rest of this chapter continues a story where Saul comes into the city, eats with Samuel, who informs him that the donkeys have actually been found. I know you were wondering. What about the donkeys? Yeah, they were found. And stayed till the next day. From there, uh, Saul will be anointed, tells no one. He's going to have signs given to him. He goes back home. He tells no one. uh, And that's the end of this narrative. So what do we walk away with with this chapter? What do we walk away with in one minute? We remember that God is not only powerful, he is active in the minute and in the large. God is active in your life every day. Often when we're studying something like this, uh, things happen. This week I'm studying about God's sovereignty and his providential care. And I mean, in several relationships, uh, we came into things that happened unexpectedly that left people wondering what the future will hold. I don't know if you're there today. I don't know if you'll be there tomorrow. I don't know if you'll be there in the next week or you've been there last week, but where you're going, "Ah, what is God doing? What is God doing? Why is this happening? Why can't I have certainty? Why, I, I, we did everything right. We provided, we, we made plans, we, we got the qualifications, we did all these things. Why isn't he acting the way we thought he was gonna act? Listen, when you get into that point, that is the absolute time you rest in and lean into his providential care. He's not here to see you fail, even though it may feel that way. He's, not, he's there to help you grow. Everything that's happening, even the negative things, even the things that are a result of your own dumb choices, he's going, I'm using it for your growth. And what growth looks like is you're gonna to continue to obey, you're gonna to continue to walk with him, you're gonna to continue to be content in him, and you're gonna depend on him more than ever. That's how we grow. And he is merciful, and he sees all of it. Listen, take assurance that there's nothing going on in your heart, mind, life, circumstances that he doesn't know about. And so you go, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. I'm gonna trust in the Lord with part of my heart. Nope, I'm gonna trust in the Lord with all of my heart. And I'm not gonna lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm gonna acknowledge him and he will actually make my path straight. That's what we see here in 1 Samuel 9. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your sovereign providential care in our life, that you care about the hairs on our head, the sparrows of the field, the donkeys that are lost. You care about who is king over Israel, and you care about every little detail of our life. And you're a good God, you're a sovereign God, you're a merciful God, you withhold the things we deserve and you lavish the things we don't. And I ask, Lord, as a people who face a a world that fear mongers, that wants us to be afraid of everything, that we'd be a people who trust your sovereign goodness, who when, when seemingly bad things happen around or happen to us, we say, yes, but you are good and you are sovereign and you're working these things out. We can't see exactly what it is, but we know exactly what you're doing. That we would rest, find rest in those realities, that we'd find joy and hope and peace in those realities that that go beyond understanding so that people will see that and say, there's something different. There's a different hope that you have. Tell us what that hope is. And we point them back to Jesus Christ, who was unfair to us and saved us from our sins. Thank you, Lord, that we can rest in a God like that. So we love you and we thank you. Keep refining us, Lord. We need it. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.